say amen, amen. Amen. Yes, Lord, we say. Thank you for your mighty hand that is upon us. Thank you for your grace that is poured out beyond measure. Thank you for the spirit of revelation and wisdom. Thank you for opening the mysteries of your will to us. Jesus was speaking once. He said, you've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, and you've revealed them unto babes. For so is pleasing in your sight. Father, I ask this morning again that your presence will come upon every life that is tuned in, whether it's this morning, this evening, or by whatever means. Open up their eyes, Lord. Grant them access. For you promised, you said to you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Break this morning prophetic seals and cause us to be able to understand your plans, your purpose for the end time church and for the world at large. Cause us to see what you see and know what you know, what is in your heart that you're trying to get across to us. Prepare us for the days ahead, for the time we're living in, the closing of the age, the time for the return of the Messiah, our Savior. Make us that people that you are looking for. A glorious church without spot and wrinkle. The bride of Christ living without spot, without defilement in these last and evil days. Shining forth with the word of truth. We give you praise, we give you glory. Let your hand rest upon every family, everyone that's connecting by whatever means and all those that will follow after. Let no one remain the same, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Can I hear an amen? amen. Good morning, everyone at home and everyone here. You know, welcome back to this prophetic season. And... Um, church online has come to stay, you know. <laughs> From now to the coming of the Lord, that's how it's going to be. There will be church, you know, right on site. There will be church online. And we're going to do our best to always bring you not only the presence of God, but his word right into your homes. Glory be to the name of Jesus. Make sure you participate in every other way. Soon now, we'll start doing DLI, discipleship programs, all kinds of things online too. So it doesn't matter where you are on earth. God provided this technology as a blessing. Remember that from June 25th, actually the opening night will be on 24th night. But from 25th, we're going to be bringing you the Prophecy Summit, the first phase. And... Um, if you're a minister of the gospel or you have a call of God in your life, this particular first phase 
you know, was designed with you. But all is available to everybody. We're going to be broadcasting uh, twice a day in the mornings and in the evening. So you can watch it live. Uh, and then uh, we'll make sure that we also keep a lot of those informations online so that you'll be able to follow up in case you miss any of the sessions. Glory be to the name of the Lord. Good morning, Pastor Lemo and Pastor Ben. You know, and uh, God bless you guys. This morning, there's a place we stopped last Sunday. And there are other questions that are triggering uh, the direction I'm going to go today that were sent. Um, uh, so we're going to pick up from somewhere the signs of the times. You remember that I went to Mark chapter 13 and Matthew chapter 24. So we're going to pick up from there. There is something I want to show you. Matthew chapter 24. We're going to read from verse 3. You will see those three questions that they asked Jesus that began the discussion. As he sat upon Mount of Olives. So get ready to read, you know. I'll just start it. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately and said, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So three questions. And he treated them. Uh, he started by, if you read from verse 1, telling them about the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. And so part of the question was about that. When will Jerusalem be destroyed? Are there signs to look out for? Then they went, second question, what are the signs of your coming? When will that one be? And then, of course, the third, what are the signs of the end of the world? Sometimes we say end of the age. So, the issue about this destruction of Jerusalem, there were some things he gave them. And, of course, I don't need to tell you that, that after Jesus died, rose again from the dead, and this was around A.D. 33. Just 37 years after, by A.D. 70, Jerusalem was destroyed. The Jewish, Jewish uh, temple was destroyed. And the Jewish nation was disbanded. Of course, that nation seeks to exist. The people who survived the massacre by the Romans were dispersed around the world. That nation did not exist for almost 2,000 years. And this was according to the divine plan too. Because that period when they were scattered is the period that is given for Christianity to grow. For the gospel to go around the world. You know, God was one that created Judaism. He was not a man-made religion. It was how God revealed himself to the Jewish people. It started with Abraham. So after his son has died on the cross and the Lamb of God has been slain, he didn't want these people continuing animal sacrifices. Many of them did not believe in Jesus. What they would have done is that every week they would be killing new animals as atonement for sin. Meanwhile, the atonement just happened on the cross. So that very day when Jesus was, was hanging on the cross, when he cried and gave up the ghost, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. The veil in the temple that used to cover the holiest of all, where the Ark of Covenant was staying, and on top of that Ark of Covenant, the Shekinah, glory of God, that veil was torn into two. And that Shekinah lifted and returned back to heaven. 
Now, this is not the first time it happened. Anytime the Shekinah leaves the temple, the temple is doomed to be destroyed. Take note of that. Whenever the Holy Spirit leaves, the temple is just a mere carcass. It's going to be destroyed. There was a time it happened in the past. Because what we're watching now, the destruction of the temple that Jesus predicted is the second time the temple will be destroyed. If I add the fact that once the tabernacle that Moses built was also destroyed and the ark of God was captured by the Philistines, that would be the third time. Before it happens, there will be a period of sin and God will be warning, calling for repentance and the people will not listen. And then they keep taking it and then finally God does the last thing. God will chastise, correct, bring messages and the people don't listen. The last thing he does, he takes away his spirit. And so in the book of Ezekiel, he showed Ezekiel before Nebuchadnezzar came to destroy the temple that Solomon built. He told Ezekiel, he took him in the spirit and took him to the temple. Showed him the idols, the different defilements that the children of Israel brought into the house of God. How they defy the house of God. They are, one of their kings by the name of Manasseh went too far. Solomon allowed his strange wives to bring idols to the city of Jerusalem. God was very angry. He married women from foreign nations that God instructed the Jews not to marry from. He started this downward trend. He was Solomon at his latter age. So when he became old, these wives brought the idols from their different countries to the city of Jerusalem. Of course, Solomon permitted them, he even encouraged, and they built altars for them. Now, at this time, these idols were in the city of Jerusalem, this city that God has chosen. Then a, some other kings rose up after Solomon that brought the idol right inside the temple. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to take note of what I'm about to say now. You hear that when the Antichrist come, he's going to set up the abomination that leads to desolation. You will read it now. Jesus, when you see that abomination that make it desolation, it is an idol set up in a place of worship in the temple of God. And then he will also stand in the temple claiming to be God and asking for worship. He said, when you see that, that is the trigger for the great tribulation. That means the time of persecution has started because there will be believers that will not bow. There will be Jewish people who know enough of the truth that will not follow that. And then he will turn and start killing them. Anytime you see that statement, it was prophesied by Daniel that the Antichrist, the world, the beast that is coming, is going to do that. I want you to know that such things has also happened in history. And every time it happens, when there is this abomination in the holy place, it leads to desolation, the destruction of the temple. I'm also warning you because the lessons from that was brought together by Paul. Paul said, if anyone defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. Defilement goes before destruction. Defilement precedes destruction. Defilement of the temple. Then God removes protection and allows the enemy to come and destroy it. When the, temp the tabernacle, the one Moses built, was destroyed, that tabernacle was staying in Shiloh for over 400 years. After they settled in promised land, they were not moving it around like they used to do in the wilderness. They now pitched it in Shiloh. There was no temple in those days. It was a tent. And the ark was inside. For 400 years, nothing could touch it. Nothing could. God was inside. 
the Shekinah was inside. The priests did their duties. In the days of Eli, the high priest, his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, would bring married women and sleep with them inside that temple. You see, that tabernacle has outer court. God was inside the holiest of holies. A lot of holy instruments were in the holy place. In the outer court where they offer sacrifice, it was an open, a large space. They would sleep with women who, who came for worship there. Then they started doing financial corruption. And they were priests. And God sent warning to their father. Their father was lenient with them. He was also old now. He said, my children, what did I hear about? He should have disciplined them. He should have even removed them. He left them. Because this priesthood goes from, it's a, it's a, 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 you know, it's a family thing. It's the family of Aaron. It's, it's the same thing with the kingship. It's from David's lineage. It passes down. Just like us, we are born into it. We are made kings and priests because we are seed of Jesus Christ who is our high priest. You have to be born in the family of the priest to be. So the next generation succession was the issue. These boys were not this properly trained. And so they started defiling that place of worship. And God sent another one in through Samuel, a little boy that just came to get training. He was still like a child. He's growing up, learning, and he's seeing these bad boys, what they were doing. But he kept his consecration. He would not join them. And God came and, and began to appear to Samuel and give him a message and say, go talk to your mentor, Eli. Then I'm going to do something. Yes, he may have served me well, but his children, I'm going to kill. What I would do, any ear that hears it will tingle. He said, when I kill them, there will not be left in their lineage any man that pisseth on the wall. They are describing how men urinate. That's male children will not be left. He said, because I will permit the enemy to come and strike in my inheritance. Who gave the devil audacity? It is when God withdraws his glory that Satan now finds us as cheap meat. Of course, the young boys continue with what they were doing. Oh, okay. Then there was war. The Philistines came because that's how it happens all the time. If you check Solom uh, Solomon's temple, it's the Babylonians. If you check the last temple, it was the Romans. The Philistines came. Burnt down, destroyed everything that, that Moses built. Hero, can you switch that thing off? Destroy the whole place. Then went inside the holies of holies that nobody enters. Captured the ark. What happened? Shekinah. There's something that used to sit on the ark. They captured it. No man man carried the ark of God. It's like, like going to heaven to arrest God or carry his throne. It's not possible. But it happened here. And then they took it down to their country. And then the two boys, the two priests, they massacred two of them. They killed them. And then of course, the wife of one of them was pregnant. It was when she heard the news that her husband and the brother the two priests of God have been killed in the battle. First of all, Eli himself, who is already an old man, when he heard the news, he fell, hit his neck, and broke his neck and died. The high priest died. Because his heart failed when he heard that the ark of God, the ark of 400, it's not possible. That's the ark that when you bring to battle from all the enemies are defeated, they are scattered. That's the ark that Joshua took, the wall of Jericho fell. That's the ark. And what happened is that when that war started, the people of Israel were fighting and they were being defeated. So they sent a message. Please bring us the ark of God. They know that when the ark comes, the battle changes. But this time they are carrying empty ark. Mm 
So they brought the ark of God and the, the Jewish army shouted. The whole place shook. The Philistines were caught by fear. They said the gods have come in their midst. They brought the ark of God. We are finished. Somebody who had revelation told them, don't mind them. God is not with them this time. Before, yes, this time because they have been misbehaving. Be courageous. If you read the story, and then they went to fight to find out truly oh, that God is not there. It was just shout, but no glory. Sometimes we have noise in the church. But it doesn't mean that God is present. And so they massacred the army of Israel, captured the priest, killed the priest, and then captured the ark. But there's something about God, He's jealous for His holy name. <laughs> so they took the ark, took it to the land of Philistine and put it in the house of their own God, Dagon. Yes, God permitted that, but it was like a testimony, Old Testament illustration of what will happen to Jesus when God himself will be captured by the enemy, killed on the cross and dragged down to hell. It was that illustration. And all of this will happen because of the sins of God's people. So, but once they got down to the temple of Dagon, God says, it's now time to teach these people who is who. And so they carry the ark, put it before Dagon, and I do. And the people went home. They came in the morning, they saw their God, Dagon, prostrating flat before the ark of God, his two hands cut off, his two legs cut off, his neck cut off. That God has been killed. He's already dead, he's, he's an idol, but whatever the power that is behind that worship has been subdued. And that's what happened when Jesus also went down to hell. He subdued principalities and powers, stripped them open, defeated Satan in his own base and took captivity captives and then came back out from the grave because the ark actually came out from Dagon and was returned back to Israel. Yes. So the rest is history. But the point I want to note is what leads to the destruction of the temple is defilement. So after that, that, the ark letter was returned. It was in the house of Obededom. A new king has emerged now, the time of David. And David built the tabernacle of David, later built the temple, you know, with Solomon built the temple. Solomon built that temple. And they brought the ark and put back in the holiest of holies. They dedicated the temple. The glory of God filled it. Everybody knows the story. The priest could not enter to minister. What is protecting you is the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. If something happens, to let that go. What you have is meat for demonic powers. What you have left. I'm sure you've seen that illustration with the first king of Israel, Saul. Yeah. And the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. What happened? An evil spirit began to torment and trouble him. He went crazy. He began to come under oppression. And if you check what Saul did to cause the spirit of God to depart from him, he not only walked in disobedience first time, there was warning, second time again, the third time that broke the camel's back is when he went to visit the witch of Endor to consult. Uh, God said it's time for this guy to die. And of course the Philistines again caught him and they killed him. David cried. He said, how are the mighty fallen? And the weapons of war destroyed. Then he made a statement. He said, how did Saul die like this? Like he was not anointed with oil. Because the anointing protects
And every time the temple is destroyed or the ark, the children of Israel who understand will mourn. They will mourn. If you go to today, to the Wailing Wall, it's called the Wailing Wall. The only wall left of the temple when the Romans destroyed it is now a prayer place, a Wailing Wall. The Jews are still praying to, for two things. For the re- coming of the Messiah, other thing is that God will give them the opportunity to rebuild the temple because where the temple should be, there is an altar there. There is an abomination that brings desolation. Don't commit it. Keep your life clean. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of holiness. Create a clean place in your life for him. Cleanse your heart, your soul, and your body. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. It's good to worship, but stop serving God water with a dirty vessel. The scripture said, be ye holy as he that called you is holy. He said, touch not the unclean thing. Come out from among them. Be ye separate and I will receive you. The Lord is the one talking. And you will be my child and you will be my son and I will be your God. God has standards. This same defilement of the temple is what is beginning to happen in last day's church. Sometimes ministers, believers everywhere are misbehaving. There is no generation that is ignorant of the scripture like this generation. They don't read the Bible anymore. And that ignorance is what makes this generation susceptible to deception. And that ignorance of the Bible also opens you up for sin and defilement. You see, it's something about the Bible. The Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from it. You start sinning, you lose your appetite for the word of God. You see, you you lose your appetite for the word, you lose your appetite for the presence of God is a symptom that you're spiritually sick. Anything called revival begins in your personal Christian life before it flows to people. have some aspect of prophecy I'm going into but this thing I'm explaining to you we will let it come up in our study of prophecy because you will see the abomination of desolation again is going to come up again in Jerusalem in the temple because there is coming a third temple yes, yes the first thing the antichrist will do he's going to sign a treaty with the Jews seven years treaty and that treaty will permit them to rebuild their temple, to pull back and create peace between them and the Palestinians. And that will break world record. You can see different presidents from the U.S. have tried. They've known Trump particularly. The Arabs pulled out of the negotiations now. He will pull it off. And so the Jews will trust him and then everybody hails him as a world hero. His entrance to the global scene will begin by doing some things that will look nice. The Bible says when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction will overtake them. Watch the language he's going to use to enter. The, it will be peace, peace, unity of religion. Let's unite so that we can stop violence, stop all these wars and killing of people. It will be things like safety. It will be things like prosperity for all. You'll be talking about economy. You'll be talking about security. You'll be talking about world peace. Watch the guy. He is on the horizon. Watch out for him. And a lot of people will follow that because the Bible said he will come to power with flatteries, with deceit. 
He knows what the problems are, global problems, and he will cash in on it. Then, seven years straight, in the middle of the week, Daniel calls it one week league, one week agreement, one week treat. In the middle, three and a half years, he will bring out his true color. He will return to the same Jerusalem with an army and go to the temple and defile it. But he's, he's not the one that will start the defiling. A lot of Jews who walk against the covenant will be misbehaving and setting up that place for problems. And he will now come and defy, do all sorts of things, put himself up as God and ask to be worshipped, build an image of himself, the image of the beast, put it in the temple, ask the whole world to start worshipping it. And then they are going to cause people to receive the mark. Now, we have not reached that point in our study, but I'm just giving you the previews. That is what will be the play, the, the prelude, the you know, that will lead to the tribulation. I want you to also know on the part of the church, deception, pollution, the Bible says iniquity will abound. That's what will lead to the tribulation. On the part of God Almighty. You might look at tribulation and think it's something bad. Why would God allow it to happen and Christians will be here? No, no, no. It's his last attempt to purify the church. It's also his last move to separate the chaff from the wheat. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Should I show them that? I have a different assignment today. Okay, okay. I will show you. I will show you. Daniel chapter 11, we will read from verse 13. Daniel chapter 11 is focusing a lot on the Antichrist. And watch what he's going to say here. For the sheep of cheating shall come against him, and therefore he shall be grieved. He's going to fight a lot of wars, you know? Yeah. And return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. He will be now be angry not only with the Jewish people, but with everything God, everything Christian. So he will return, have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. I want you to take note of that. There are a lot of backsliding Christians, a lot of backsliding Jews that have abandoned. They are the ones that will guide him and help him develop how to destroy the church and how to attack Israel. I want you to know that the enemy without does not succeed without cooperation of those with him. Before the Antichrist shows up, there is first one world religion that will show up and is going to be led by a so-called Christian leader, a global leader. They have abandoned the faith. They are going to create a powerful coalition and they will be the one to pioneer the move to go against God's church. There will be first defilement before destruction. Lord, please open the eyes of my listeners. There's coming a powerful religious leader. He's already in place. And it's going to lead a coalition to form one world religion. And that one world religion is supposed to lead people away. It's going to be completely, it, we're going to see they're turning away from the faith like never before. Oh, Lord. Okay, okay, okay. Let me backtrack. Last Sunday, I read a scripture. Maybe I need to read it again. I'm coming back to Daniel's uh, scripture. I need to read it again for you so that you take note of that. When you read Matthew 24, Jesus warns about deception, the rise of false prophets and false Christ. There must be religious corruption before this man will have the authority to implement the great tribulation.
and I'm showing you the prevailing atmosphere under which the beast will arise. If you look at Christianity, look at Europe, the church is almost dead there. It's completely a backsliding continent. If you look at even here in Africa where God is trying to have his last move, look at a lot of nonsense that are coming up. This Hophini and Phinehas in ministry, in a new generation of pastors and priests that are not properly discipled, that are not properly trained in priesthood, I imagine now doing all kinds of things. They're creating the environment for the rise of the beast. In the book of Nezek, cannot come destroy the temple without the Jews first defiling the temple. Apart from what happened in the days of Eli, and the, the tabernacle was destroyed. So later, they built Solomon's temple. And for years, the people served God, the revivals, the move of God. Then later, kings and priests emerged that were walking in darkness. They started bringing abominations of the nations into that temple. It got to a king called Manasseh. Manasseh took the idols of different and brought it inside the temple re erected them remember abomination of desolation is when idolatry now enters the house of God that's the final straw that breaks the camel's back Manessa brought it right inside the temple even in the chambers where the priests operate and all, they put a different idols and people will come to worship God they will now be worshipping all this some pastors are now bringing in occultism and secretism into Christianity. Now watch. God raised Jeremiah the prophet and started warning them. You see this temple is going to be destroyed. At that time when he was warning, he was hoping for repentance. So in the holiest of holies, the Holy Spirit has not left. The Shekinah was still in the temple. But in the outer court, in the holy place, they have brought defilement. Because some people tell you, if I pollute my body, it doesn't touch my spirit. Be warned. If I defy the body, it doesn't really, the, Jesus lives in my heart. Not, it, does, it, does, it will not affect. Be warned. Jeremiah said to them, you said the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, nobody can destroy it. He said, have you forgotten that my house used to be in Shiloh. Now we are in Jerusalem. The temple is in Jerusalem. Remember where I used to live. Moses' tabernacle used to be there for 400 and something years. Go there now and see the desolation. You can't see it anymore. Go to my house that was in Shiloh. If you check Jeremiah 6, Jeremiah 16, you will see what Jeremiah said there. Go to my house that was in Shiloh. Where I used to put my name. I permitted it to be destroyed because of the iniquity of my people. Before the temple is destroyed, the people of God will be the ones to defile it first, opening the door for the enemy. It happens at personal level. It happens at corporate level. Go there and see what I did to it because of the iniquity of my people. It's the Philistines that destroyed it. Now he now warns them. You see this temple? It's going to be destroyed. The Babylonians are going to come. They will destroy Jerusalem. They will burn down this house that is called by my name. And they will carry you people to captivity. Now, when you study Daniel's prophecy, you need to see from where Daniel began. What happened that led to the captivity. Because Daniel was among those that was brought down there as a captive to Babylon. Ezekiel was another prophet that was brought down there. He wasn't a prophet as at the time, but from Babylon, he chose not to walk with the lifestyle of Babylon. Sadek consecrated, and God opened him up and brought him into the prophetic ministry. So there were two voices speaking from Babylon, Daniel and Ezekiel. Actually, Ezekiel's prophetic ministry has even started before he got down there. He had started. He had but another dimension opened up while he was in Babylon. Yeah. Daniel was the one that grew his prophetic in the land of Babylon because he came in there as a young a teenager and then developed that. Now watch. 
Jeremiah warned them. They didn't listen. Then God called Ezekiel and said, come, I'm taking you to the temple. And he took him to the temple. And he showed him the Shekinah, the glory and all that. And he said, watch. And the glory of God lifted from the, the top of the Ark of Covenant, the mercy seat, and moved to the east, the altar. And they lifted from the altar, moved to the, and left through the eastern gate and flew over the mountain and vanished back to heaven. The Lord has taken away his presence. He said, what you have now is an empty building. Watch what will happen. It wasn't long. Nebuchadnezzar invaded with his army, besieged Jerusalem. They invaded that city. He went to that temple, carried all the remaining vessels of God's house. All those things they used to carry them and they carried them to Babylon. Of course, the only thing this time they didn't capture is the Ark of Covenant. God gave Jeremiah instruction what to do. He took it, he told him where to go and hide it in a cave, and he did. And some unique vessels, you know, but the rest of the vessels, everything, all they go, then, then later they burned down that whole temple. It was burnt down. And Jerusalem was destroyed, and the Jews were massacred. You ask, these are things you need to understand about the coming tribulation. And then they carried them captive to Babylon. Babylon is going to make another attack on the entire church. And that's what the Bible calls a time of great tribulation. But there are things that created, there are things, prelude that is making that possible. Oh, oh, like they established to go for CC, name it here, Abati, and Ishoko. Some of you have been reading it in the book of Thessalonians. That he that led to led till he is taken out of the way. It is not rapture of the church. It's not rapture yet. It's the oppression of the Holy Spirit walking through the church. What is stopping the enemy is a triumphant church filled with the spirit carrying the word of righteousness and living for God is a deterrent there is nothing in prophecy that has not happened before so anything you are studying don't go and use your own brain and be explaining the Bible go back the explanations are in the Bible the key to the future is in the past the past history is prophecy fulfilled Prophecy is history being written in advance. Anytime you go to history and look, you will see where what God is telling you in the future has happened. It's happened as a lesson for those who will live at the time when it will happen again. Because you see the whole thing about divine program, it works in cycles. In cycles. If somebody is talking to you about summer we're in summer now globally so let me talk about winter and you have never seen winter before just go and study what happened last year's winter and you have an idea of the one you're about to meet that's how there is what you call prophetic cycles there is nothing new under the sun whatever it is that's coming has happened before That was why when Jeremiah was warning them about the destruction of the temple, he told them, go to history. Go and check Shiloh and how that place was destroyed. Learn. And once the people of God start defiling the temple of God, trouble is on the way. Tribulation is going to sort it out. You come to the church now, the same thing. We don't just have deep states. We have deep church. A group of religious leaders that have aligned with the new world order. They are working to bring one world religion. 
no matter what you worship, whether you worship idol, worship be in all court, is one God. And they're, all, they're going to unite everybody. You can't tell anybody repent. You can't tell anybody believe in Jesus. No. It's different ways to the same God. In those days, you come up and say, there is it's one God, one mediator between man. Persecution starts for you because they see you as somebody causing division. And a couple of religious leaders are selling out to that. The tribulation is what is going to sort this out. I want you to understand why the church will be here when this happens. Because there is a separation that needs to be made so that those who, those who are going can go. The church as it is now has both Esau and Jacob inside it. It has both Cain and Abel. It has both the wheat and the tars. Not everybody that comes to church now is a child of God. Not everybody that is calling himself a pastor, a minister, is born again. The church Jesus is coming for is a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Okay, I need to, I need to read scriptures for you. I think I've been talking. The best thing is when the scripture shows it to you. So, Second Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to read from verse 1. No, Corinthian Thessalonians is what I'm looking for now. Thessalonians. The scripture we read last week. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to read from, from verse 1. Pastor Ben, read for me so I can go back to Matthew 24. What I'm reading here, you will see it in Matthew 24 also. Okay. Two things you're going to see here. Great falling away will come first. The Antichrist will come second. Then the rapture will be taught. This is the order. Let me say it again in case you are missing it. The great falling away, the great falling away, a time when a lot of believers fall out of the faith. And, you know, then that is the prelude to the great tribulation because that creates the room for the Antichrist to come. Then the rapture will now follow. It's in that order. Not the rapture before the tribulation. That is not going to happen. It's not in the Bible. It doesn't matter who is preaching it and all that. Yeah, we're looking for a way to escape. But let me tell you, what you're trying to escape, the early church went through it. The church is going to exit the way it started. It's going to be a glorious church that is on fire. Go check the early church. They were a revival, but there was also persecution. That's also how it's going to be. This thing is what is going to purify and preserve the remnant. I will show you how it's going to play out. But... But, but take note of that. The three order. You will see it now as you read. And when you read Matthew 24, you see it's the same order that Jesus set up. Okay, read. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, we are reading from verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. Take note, two things. The coming of Jesus and our gathering, our gathering together unto him is what is called the rapture of the church. When he comes to take the bride. Take note of that. Okay. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Okay, verse 3 now. I want everybody, and if you are at home, you can bring out your Bible and check whether what you are reading is true. Verse 3 now. Watch. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. The first thing is a falling away. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know why all these rise of false pastors, false prophets, and fake believers everywhere, that's what is going on now. Is the prelude to the rise of the beast. Because when the beast comes, people have to agree with him, especially Christians. He's not going to gain global power without their support. 
There has to be pastors, there has to be popes and bishops that must give him the backing. Without that, it's not going to happen. Hey, you're blessed, Tadika. There are some things I can't say on there. This year, 2020, last year, the unity of religion pack has been signed. This year now, they are going to ratify it by September in Belgium. And then, they are going to start a new program to re-educate the young people all over the world, in schools, in churches, to teach them how to live new lifestyle. Family is going to be redefined. It's already happening in some Western countries, but it's not going to become a global issue. Family is going to be redefined. It's no more just father, mother, and children. It could be mother, mother, and children. It could be father, father. There are many things that are going to redefine. I'm going to start now telling you that the Bible needs to be edited. Some things like the S words and some other things need to be removed from it. Like all this sin, sin. You don't need that. It disturbs the person. Don't preach that. It makes people feel guilty, feel funny. Preach what makes people feel good. There are a lot of things. And they have already started these programs I'm talking about. There is already an edited Bible. Whatever. Preserve a copy of the Bible. Preserve it on hard disk. The one that will not go into the system. Because they, once they put the program, it will change all the things. Even if you like have it in your... I'm talking about laptops that are not being connected to the internet. Preserve the Bible. Days are coming. It will be outlawed to carry this book. You will go to jail. You can be killed for it. Preserve the knowledge of Christ. This is the time. Get to know him for yourself. And get, if you have not gone through discipleship or not, this is the time. Days are coming. You will be looking for church. You can't have this opportunity again. They control even the communication media. They will not allow us to preach like this. They're already beginning to censure certain things that had to do with the gospel. Okay, verse 3. Watch verse 3. Okay, read. Let's go. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Yes. And the man of sin be revealed. So the Antichrist will come second. Yes. The son of perdition. Who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God. Or that is worshipped. So that he as God seated in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is God. Now before this Philistine, this Babylonian goes to the temple. To now defy and do the Christians first defile that place, making it habitable for the enemy. I want you to take note of the falling away first. I'm not saying every believer, no, the people of God will remain true, and that's what will lead to the crash and start persecution. Because there are people that will not take that mark. There are people that will not bow down to that image. There are people that will not do that. And then, so everywhere you read this, you see he's going to make war with the saints and over, overcome them. Or he's going to try to wear out the saints of the most. I've stopped explaining it away. Those saints are talking about believers. They will persecute the saints of the most. Those are Christians. No, they are not left behind Christians. No rapture has occurred. A good friend of mine, and he's a minister of the gospel, he's not the bad guy. He's not one of the bad guys. But because of this pre-tribulation rapture, they have to find a way to make us fly away before they don't want to hear that the church will be here and face that persecution. So you ask him, you say we have flown away. Yes, show me where. He will go to the book of Revelation chapter 4 where the Lord ap appeared to John, the apostle, and said, come up here. 
and I will show you things that will be here after. He said, that's the rapture of the church. Ah. Other people have been coming up here. It's vision. You are being called up to be shown things that will come in the future. You say, that's the rapture. I have been granted that privilege a number of times. Did any rapture occur? Even me, did I get raptured? It's vision. It's like Paul the Apostle who said, I know a man in Christ whether in the body or out of the body. He gets caught up to the third heaven and he shows mysteries that are not allowed for men to speak here. So when Paul experienced being caught up in vision and he was shown things, was that rapture? They are just looking for a way to put it before the trouble starts. You won't find it in the Bible. The way the church will exit is the way Israel exited Egypt. They were in Egypt when all the plagues, you know all those ten plagues, even till the last one. But God protected them in the midst of it all. And after all of that, God removed his people out of Egypt and sent them to the promised land. That's how it's going to happen again. The last days of the church here, we're going to see things happen on this earth. Okay, Pastor Ben, verse 3 said, that day, read it again, that day will not come, whether it is our gathering to meet the Lord, which is rapture or his return, it will not come except there is great falling away first. And then the man of sin, the Antichrist, is revealed. The Antichrist is the one Read, yes, read a little about the Antichrist, his son of perdition, verse 4. Read more about him. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Yes, verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things, Yes, verse 6. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Yes. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of so the way. So this, this is the scripture some people interpret to mean the church must be raptured so he can show up. That's not what he's talking about. Check all the historical precedent so you can see. Before Noah's flood, when the watchers came, slept with the daughters of men, eh? if you know about that story, Genesis chapter 6, they created giants, men of renown, and there was wickedness all over the earth. And things were happening, a lot of problems. Everybody was here. Noah was here. Enoch was here. The, the record showed that that happened in the time of Jared, Enoch's father. Enoch rose up, led a mighty move of God in the midst of this. It was right somewhere in the course of that that he was taken and he became the seventh generation from Adam, a symbol of the rapture of the church. The same thing with the Jews in Egypt. Where God removes his people, like in the case of Noah, is before he pours the flood, which is judgment. And before God sends judgment, he will remove us. We are not called for the wrath of God. Remember that one. The great tribulation is not the way some people are reading it. And I'm going to show you a few things now. Okay, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who let it will let it. The taking out of the way, verse 8. And then shall the wicked be revealed. Whom check, they... check all the precedents I've shown you. The temple in Shiloh, the tabernacle. Defilement, the glory is removed 
the enemy comes and destroys Philistines at that time. The temple in Jerusalem, Solomon built. The Shekinah, the defilement first. The Shekinah lived. Babylonians came and destroyed. Are you seeing that? The last temple again. Jesus was warning them. He said, I tried to gather you as a sheep. As a hen gathers her chick. But you will not. Three and a half years he was here preaching to them. You didn't. It's the same Jewish people that plotted his death. It's not the Romans first. It's the, the people of God first. It's the people. He came to his own people. They, some people that were the ones that rejected him. He said, I tried to gather you like a hen gathers her. But you will not. But now your house is left unto you desolate. So he started talking about this temple that you poor are growing on. There will be no stone left upon another. It's going to be brought down. This city will be destroyed. He said, the reason is because you did not know the time of your visitation. So, on the cross again, the moment he gave up the ghost, the Shekinah, the, 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 the curtain was torn, the glory left. It's now an empty house. Guess who came this time? The Romans led Titus. They came and destroyed it, and the Jewish people were scattered. And Paul, having studied these three episodes, now left us a warning in the book of Corinthians. He said, if anyone defies the temple of God, God will destroy him. He even explains how God does the destruction. He said, hand such a man over to Satan for the destruction of the body that the spirit might be saved on the Lord's day. You see what happens? That when there is defilement, God withdraws protection and hands the man over to Satan. Is it not 1 Corinthians 3 verse 17? If any man defies the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, and that temple ye are. He's warning us about the church, which is now God's tabernacle. He's also warning us about individual lives. And so, see the level of defilement that is rising in today's church. We need a revival, though. We need a revival in these last days. And God is working to get that. The falling away first before the man of sin. Okay, okay, okay. Glory, read uh, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verse 3. Let them see what is this falling away. Let no one deceive or beguile you in any way. For that day will not come, except the apostasy comes first. Unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians has come. Do you see that? Apostasy, people turning away from Christ, turning away from their faith. The, uh, the, the falling away of those who have professed to be Christians. Turn away. They are no more living in the world. They are doing all kinds of things. Except that comes first. The man of sin will not come and then the rapture will not come. And then go ahead, yes. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, who is the son of perdition. Go ahead. Who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and insolently against and over all that is called God or that is worshipped, taking his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming that he himself is God. That's the Antichrist. Actually, the story has not ended there. If you go down, he said his coming will be with lying signs and wonders. A lot of, you know, and all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Not just false miracles and signs. There will be a seduction of people to be committing sin and feel that there is nothing wrong with that. All types of deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Maybe you should read that verse 10. Okay, we'll start from verse 9. The coming of the lawless one. You see, they call him lawless one, yes? 
is through the activity and working of Satan and will be attended by great power and with all sorts of pretended miracles and signs and delusive marvels and lying oh, wonders. Pretended miracles, delusive marvels and lying wonders. But they will make it. If you see magic shows, it will look real and people will believe it. Guy will pull some tricks, can even make fire fall from heaven. Yes, go ahead, verse 10. And by unlimited seduction to evil. Seduction to evil. Deceivableness of unrighteousness. People will be turning to commit. The Bible says iniquity will abound. The gospel will be pushing people to righteousness. This one will be pushing people to liberty. Do what you like. Do this one. Yes, go ahead. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. Because they did not welcome the truth, but refused to love it, that they might be saved. So, they've given us 2,000 years to hear the gospel, to believe the gospel. To An alternative is going to come in the last days. Yeah, it's already coming. If you're the type that wants to be immoral, there will be a new gospel that will encourage you to do what you like. And still believe that you are. If you are the type that wants to be rebellious, it's a time of lawlessness. There will be redefinition of most of the things, teachings of the Bible. If you are the type that wants to rebel against authority, there will be already there in existence encouraging people. If you are the type that wants anything, slander, there will be. Is going to lead a massive revival of lawlessness, immorality, seduction, deception, and he's going to work with a religious leader. It's going to be marriage of politics and religion. The political leader is the Antichrist, but he's going to work with this religious leader. He's going to help you unite the world religion and move them in this direction. And then those who refuse to play along are the ones that will call the problem. And they will start persecuting them and killing them. As a minister of the gospel, any preacher that does not prepare the church for what is coming, and they already plan to start it with 2020, I think God is going to give us a few more time just to get the church ready. I pray he give a few more to just to get the church ready because that's what they want to start implementing now. Take away all these rights that you've been enjoying all these years. And then a time of persecution is ahead. Everybody that calls himself a Christian needs to get ready for that. This one is worldwide persecution. But it's nothing new. The early church knew that for hundreds of years. The Bible said everyone that will live a godly life in Christ Jesus should expect persecution. Let it not be a strange thing to you. Actually, that's why the Bible said these days that we're entering, prophecy predicted that they will overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. He added one more thing, John. In the book of Revelation chapter 12, they love not their lives unto death. If he has to come to that, you are not backing out. And if your faith in Christ cannot endure fire, that faith is fake. Fire does not destroy gold. It only purifies it. Oh, okay, okay. Let me take you to Daniel chapter 11. You know, we started from verse 30, 30. So you can see this. You see what happens that prepares the ground. There are people who walk against the covenant. And when the enemy comes, he's going to corrupt them with flatteries. Okay. Um, the sheep of Chittim shall come against him. He's talking about the Antichrist. 
you know, f- f- uh, we're not doing the study from the beginning. Okay, Daniel chapter 11. But the sheep of cheating shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. This is where it starts. So he shall do. When he returns, he will have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. There are a group of believers that are in that state of backsliding state, turned away from the faith. They are the ones that will now help advise him and organize him. There is coming what some people call deep church. They talk Christianity, but they have aligned with the enemy. They are going to walk with him and help providing guidance. Glory, read Daniel 11, verse 30. For the ships of Kittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and discouraged and turn back and carry out his rage and indignation against the holy covenant and God's people. And God's people. Of course, he's going to attack Israel, attack the Jewish people. But then go ahead. And he shall do his own pleasure. He shall even turn back and make common cause with those Jews who abandoned the holy covenant with God. Do you see that? There will be Jews in Israel that have abandoned their faith, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who align with him. There will be believers too, or let me not use the word believer, Christians, including ministers, who align with him. And then, verse 31, yes? And armed forces of his shall appear in the Holy Land. So he's going to come with an army and invade Jerusalem, yes? And they shall pollute the sanctuary. You see what we're talking about? The temple. They will pollute the temple, yes? The spiritual stronghold and shall take away the continual daily bond offering. All sacrifices, they will remove all that, yes? And they shall set up in the sanctuary the abomination that astonishes and makes desolate. That abomination is an idol. Revelation chapter 13 calls it the image of the beast. It will be set up right in the temple. Yes. And such as violate the covenant. No, no, no. Look at how King James reads it. Um, No, no. Amplified Bible. He said, Amphosis of his shall appear in the holy land they shall pollute the sanctuary the spiritual stronghold they shall take away the continual daily burnt offering they shall set up in the sanctuary inside it the abomination that astonishes and makes desolate an altar to a pagan god it's not just an altar the image of it verse 32 yes and such as violates the covenant, he shall pervert and seduce with flatteries. King James said he shall, you know, corrupt with flatteries. There are people that are already violating the covenant. Amplify said, such as violate the covenant, he shall pervert and seduce with flatteries. So this falling away of certain believers is what will prepare the ground because he needs the cooperation of such people to be able to do the rest of the things he will need to do. This would have turned away from the covenant. It will happen in Israel. It will happen in the church. It will seduce with flatteries. But of course the people that do know their God shall prove themselves strong and shall stand firm and do exploits for God. Can I hear an amen for that one? Now, now because I'm looking at the Antichrist Later in the course of these teachings, not today, I'm going to look at the exploits the saints will be doing. Don't think everybody is cowing down. People are going to be doing it. So the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Can I hear another amen on that? Yeah. Everybody is not bowing down. Verse 33. Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you the purpose, why God even permitted the saints to be here when the tribulation happens. Remember that Ephesians chapter 5 said that the church Jesus is coming for is a church without spot and wrinkle. Righteous men, holy men, 
godly people. So the tribulation will serve a number of purposes. One of them, to separate the chaff because all of these people who are not really here to serve God, who are false converts, will defect. False ministers, they will all go on that side. You know what fire does when you are refining? It separates the dross. The real gold comes out on this side. That's what is going to happen. Second thing that is going to happen is that for those who are God's people, it will help purify them and make them ready for his coming. Just as you read. So don't think God is doing something that is going to work against us. Nothing works against God or his people. Never forget that. All things work together for good to them that love God who are called according to his purpose. Yes, the enemy will do that, but God uses it to work out his purpose. Take, for example, this meltdown. There are a lot of blessings. I mean, this lockdown, global lockdown, as a result of this pandemic, there are a lot of blessings that has come out of it. One lady called me and said, I've not been reading my Bible in the last 12 years. I can't remember even prayer, I just go to church, whatever they tell me there. He said, this time, if I tell you, I've gone through the Bible, and then my children, it was when we started, I realized these kids don't know anything. I just leave them for children's church, only to, they attend one church in Lagos, only to find that they were teaching them nothing. He said, I became the pastor in my house. I'll get my husband to sit down, and we do devotion, and we, since we're at home, we're not doing anything, what else? And he said, I have grown so much. Now I can tell you that I'm a Christian. So let's read Daniel chapter 11, verse 33. I want you guys to see the purpose for the tribulation. The good purpose. You, you, why it looks like something that is going uh, evil because it's persecution time. Look at what it's producing for the saints. Now, okay, Pastor Ben, read first. Then I'll ask her to read in that translation. Verse 33. We'll read all the way to 35, yes. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. So it's a time when a lot of believers are going to rise up. And that's what you need to do post-COVID-19. You don't even need to wait till post-COVID. Now, we are bringing you this knowledge so you will know what is happening. Rise up and be among that remnant that is instructing many. It's a time of a move of God, the Enoch revolution. The last day's move of God. Help open the eyes of many. Go ahead, sir. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame and by captivity and by spoil many days. Actually, the number of days that we have been predicted is 1,260 uh, days. The Bible gave the the duration, three and a half years. Now, okay. When this season starts, it's not going to stop us from preaching. We'll be doing our best, just like we're doing it, to open the eyes of many. But in those days, preaching the gospel will cost you one of these four things. Number one, the sword. Some people will be beheaded. Number two, captive. The flame, some people will be burnt alive. Go check the early church. Study, for example, buy this book, the Fox Book of Martyrs. So you see how believers used to die then. Study, Google it today, how the 12 apostles of Jesus died. You will see some that were crucified. You will see some that were beheaded. Paul, that we are reading his work, was beheaded. Peter was crucified. He asked to be crucified upside up. Some were burnt. It's not a new thing. I want you to know that. First, by sword, beheaded. Second, by flame. Some will be burnt. Third, by captivity. Some will be sent to prison. Captivity is prison. What did you do? That you preached the gospel. You're trying to help people understand what God is doing. That's why they are arresting you. What's the fault? Spoil. What is spoil? 
they seize your property, seize good. Sometimes seize church property, seize buildings or whatever, or flu, freeze your account. What, what is your offense? You're teaching people to, be, to live right, to fear God, to walk with God. That's your offense. So now that we have the time, my friends, rise up now and begin to preach the gospel. Now we still have the time. Days are coming. You, you, can't, you can't hold service. You can't. Now you can do crusades. Rise up and do it. Now you can plant church. Rise up and plant it. Now you can start a cell. Start doing it. Better make sure that your life counts. Now that it's still free, you still have the freedom. One medical doctor wrote me. He said, please, pastor, pray that they start the open church. Let them allow church service. He said, I've been at home and we are doing this house thing. There is not the same thing. I don't, I'm beginning to feel like I'm, the presence of God is, that it's not like the same thing when they go for worship. I said, better buy keyboard, teach your children how to play and bring the full thing into your home. Get hymn books. Get whatever that helps you in worship. Better do prayer time before you do study. You must learn to practice God's presence. Those days are coming. We've been taking pastors for granted, church service for granted. Hey, hey, hey. You're going to have to be your own pastor. You're going to have to pastor your children. Just like the early church, a lot of the operations were underground. A lot of the operations were in house fellowships, home to home. Uh, persecution come, a lot of these things will go underground. Let me talk to us today. Every one of you should go and study the Chinese church, what happened during the communist era. Christianity, they were about 800,000 Christians when the communist revolution. Chama Mao led the communist revolution. And there were 10,000 missionaries. They were all sent out of China. All the pastors were arrested. Somebody like uh, Watchman Ni stayed and died in prison. One of the most prominent Chinese preachers of that time. They sacked all the missionaries, arrested all the pastors, seized all the church buildings. Not a single church building was left. Stop any form of broadcast on TV or on any form of technology. And then started hunting Bibles. They didn't want any Bible of any type in the whole of China. The Communist Republic of China. Then they started persecuting Christians. The church went underground. All churches now operate as cell groups. All churches operate only in the house. They even started coming to houses to check those doing fellowship, to arrest them. They banned preaching. They banned the Bible. They banned every form of it. All of you should go and study what happened to Christianity. The Western missionaries from America, from Britain, all cried. They were praying for China. They said the church, because it's a young church, it will die. Who told you? Church does not die because of persecution. I said fire does not destroy gold. It only purifies it. When China finally opened up to the world again, after 30 years, do you know what they found? That less than 1 million believers, 800,000, has grown to about 150 million. Now, go, 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 what I'm saying. The Christians, I mean evangelical born-again Christians in China are more than all the people in the Communist Party. The Communist Party has about 90 million people. The church grew when it went underground. The church grew when they remove all the pastors. The church grew when they removed all the church buildings. The church grew when they stopped crusade. The church grew when they stopped uh, preaching on TV. The church grew when they removed. Of course, what the missionaries now, the Western churches did, is to make sure they found a way to smuggle Bible. And they caught some of the smugglers. People who risk their life and load Bible and smuggle it across Chinese border. From South Korea and other neighboring countries, Taiwan, Hong Kong. And sometimes they succeed. You can imagine that Kenny Hagin books like Authority of the Believer and one other book by him. They succeeded in bringing it into China. And the Chinese Christians started mass producing it. 
Then they learned the authority in Christ. They became aggressive in prayer. They started, and that's what finally helped to open up that country. Now, watch. When communism fell, they found out that the church that was not up to 1 million, 800 and something, has grown to over 150 million. What happened? It was when believers discovered that we are all ministers, we are all priests, every family becomes church. And that's when the thing grew. They started reaching out to their neighbors. They started reaching out to their family members. Everybody will reach their own neighborhood. And when it's time for service, a lot of the church services hold on the ground. They will build shop, put a door somewhere into the ground. Where when they are singing, you won't be able to hear the sound outside. And sometimes they caught them. There were a few times where they were betrayers. The person is still a young convert. He's not yet stable. And they catch him. He'll go and reveal where the believers And they will arrest them. The people were imprisoned. He didn't stop the inside prison. They are preaching. Most of the books we are reading of you watch my knee. Some of his greatest books he wrote in prison. When you hear great tribulation, it's persecution. Get it clear. Okay, let's read 33 again. Gloria reads. I think you should read from 32 first. Yeah. And such as violate the covenant... He shall pervert and seduce with flatteries. But the people who know their God shall prove themselves strong and shall stand firm and do exploits people for God. People are going to do exploits even in those days. Then verse 33. And they who are wise and understanding among the people shall instruct many and make them understand. Though some of them and their followers shall fall by the sword. Did you see it? Some of them who are trying to help people get the gospel. Some of them and their followers shall fall by the sword, yes. And flame. Yes. By captivity. Yes. And plunder. Yes. For many days. It's three and a half years. The tribulation will last for three and a half years. The Bible said those days will be shortened for the sake of the elect. And God has got it three and a half years. Yes, go ahead, verse 34. Now when they fall they shall receive a little help. Many shall join themselves to them with flatteries and hypocrisies. You see, this is what one of the purposes of the tribulation, to sort out this chaff. Because there are a lot of people joining the entire church with hypocrisy, with flattery. They say the word. They are not genuine Christians. They can't withstand any heat. They can't endure to try us or whatever for the sake of Christ. They came to God for what they would get from God. And there's a type of gospel we have preached that has attracted them. We have not discipled them. One of the strategies for the end time church going forward is to return back to discipleship and to return back to small groups. And all of you that are listening to me, start your own cell. That is the way forward. These large congregations and worship services, this thing has shaken it up now. This lockdown, Something more serious is on the horizon. Make sure you are a functional priest, that you know God. Start reading your Bible. People don't study their Bible anymore. They only come on Sunday, open their mouth for pastors to feed them. Now, when the pastor is saying something wrong, you can't tell. Many shall join to them with flatteries and with hypocrisy. So add verse 35. And some of those who are wise, prudent, and understanding shall be weakened and fall. Thus then the insincere among the people will lose courage and become deserters. So watch what will happen. When persecution starts and some believers are killed or whatever, the insincere, the hypocrites, these fake people will desert. The Bible calls all the submission of all that the great falling away. When they, because they can't take persecution for Christ, they will desert and abandon the faith. 
so that the remnant can stay. Is that remnant that Christ is coming for? I'm letting you people see what the Bible says, the purpose for the tribulation. Now, because you don't think God is trying to do something bad by allowing his church to stay here. Why he is letting the church go through that? Because some of you, because you are told it's pre-tribulation rapture, you are wondering, what's Pastor David saying? I'm not the one, it's your Bible. I'm only help you understand it. Oh, like I said last week, I prefer that we're pre-tribulation rapture. I prefer that one so that we can vanish without any persecution. Who wants persecution? Is he, is he sweet to the flesh? No. But that's the reality on the ground. And the reality is that we now have false conversion, false ministers. We have all kinds of people that are in the church but they are not in the kingdom. And at the last days, the angels are going to make separation between the tars from the weeds. Read 35 one more time as I begin to, you know. And some of those who are wise, prudent, and understanding shall be weakened and fall. Thus then, the insincere among the people will lose courage and become deserters. It will be a test to refine, to purify, and to make those among God's people white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for the time God appointed. What is the purpose? To refine, to purify, to make God's people white, even to the time of the end. Are you guys getting the gist? I'm amazed that time has just gone again and I'm, I've not gone into Matthew chapter 24 because there were things I'm supposed to show you today. And just discussing the great tribulation and the reason for it, time just went. What will happen is a test. I'm reading it. This Amplified Bible. To refine, to purify, and to make those among God's people white even to the time of the end because it's yet for an appointed time. So apart from the separation to remove false believers is also to prepare us for the rapture. And that's why I tell if you remain a lukewarm Christian, what will wake you up is coming. You better not wait for that. Better not. Now we have the time. Let's take advantage of it to reach the world for Christ, to reach our communities, to reach our cities, to make sure that our family members are in the ark before the flood starts, to make sure that we reach everybody. Now we have technology, the freedom to do everything. Let's utilize it. Now we have the chance. Let's live for God and live for Christ and be completely sold out to him. And if you are not saved, if you are not born again, this is the time to do that before it's too late. You have to give your life to Christ and repent for your sins. Turn away from unrighteousness. And if you're a believer, turn away from defilement. Turn away from those things. Turn away from sin. Consecrate your life wholly to the Lord. And if you're there, you want to give your life to Christ, say this with me. You can put your hands on your chest for your home. Say this, Lord, thank you for giving me the privilege to hear this message. Lord, I recognize that I'm a sinner and I repent of my sins. Please forgive me and cleanse me with the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for me on Calvary, on the cross. I believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for my salvation. And I believe and confess that you raised him from the dead. And now with my mouth, I confess him as the Lord of my life and as my Savior. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and personal Savior. I pledge my life to you, Lord, that I will live for you. I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you pray that prayer, that begins the journey for you, your Christian race. Because the miracle of the greatest change ever 
has happened in your life is a miracle of new birth. And I'm praying for you now in the name of Jesus Christ, God's Holy Son, that the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you, that the blood of Christ will wash away your sin, and that the miracle of transformation, personal transformation and regeneration will take place in your heart. That the old nature will be taken away and a new nature, the divine nature will come into your life. And God will empower you to run this race to the finish line, to the end. In Jesus' mighty name. Find a good church. And start attending. Join a good believe a group of believers. Christianity is a team sport, just like football. You're not going to win a world championship playing that ball alone. There is need for fellowship, not forsaking the assembly of yourself together. There is a personal side to it, but it's a team sport. Join other believers. Start reading your Bible. Start talking to the Lord and praying, and start witnessing and. In, you know, letting others know about Jesus and the things you are learning in this broadcast. Make sure you are sharing it with others. Use your WhatsApp, your messages. Hook them up to the broadcast when you can. And when you can, share with them. Take the video, post it. Share with them what you are learning. Make sure you are winning souls. God bless you. Praise the Lord. 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 Praise the